Hello and welcome. Now in this video, we're going to be talking about the optimal computer setup and that is to use multiple screens if you're not doing that already. One of the first things that best practice when you are using Camtasia 9 is that you make the use of multiple screens and that can be the screen on your laptop as well as a monitor. It can be the screen on your desktop as well as another monitor. It can be two monitors. The fact of the matter is that you need to make use of multiple screens if you're going to be most effective in screencasting. And making those monitors available and making them work with your operating system is very easy to do in Windows and Mac. In fact, Windows and Mac operating systems make accommodations for people who use multiple screens. They anticipate that you're going to make use of multiple screens. An additional monitor is not expensive, so it probably you talking in the area of $50 used, maybe $100 new. Typically, an additional monitor could be picked up for as little as $50 used and $100 new. Now, you're going to want to purchase as high of a resolution that you can when you get the monitor, and we're going to say that at minimum, you should be looking for 1920 by 1080 pixels. That is probably the standard at which you're going to be producing videos and that you want to edit your videos. And if you have a laptop that has that resolution, then you want to be able to use your screen effectively using the same resolution. Here's what multiple screens do. They allow you to toggle back and forth between notes and screens and other things that will help you to create your video. For example, you're looking at the recording toolbar here, and we have been able to move this back and forth due to the multiple screen environment. And what this does is this allows you to focus on what you are describing, and it also gives you some alternatives, especially when you're using, especially when you're using the screenwriting tools and everything else that you're going to be using as you start to screencast. In fact, it's going to make it very easy for you to be able to do PowerPoint videos. And one of the things that you have probably noticed, and maybe you noticed in one of the previous videos in the basic course, is that you can switch back and forth between the presenter view as well as the display view. And this really does help you to be able to monitor where you are. So for example, you were looking at a slide presentation and when you have a multiple screen environment you can actually look over to the right and know what's coming next you can actually start to plan in your mind as to what you're actually going to be saying about what you're going to be describing to your audience and this is especially helpful when you're screencasting but we're going to go ahead and switch back to the presenter view of course, if you can make use of three monitors, you can be even more efficient because you can spread some of the load across three monitors and be effective. In some case, if you have a document you're referring to during your PowerPoint presentation, as well as having that PowerPoint staging area, as well as having your presentation, again, taking advantage of multiple screens is a very effective way of being able to use Camtasia. And this does not have to be expensive or fancy. You can have something as simple as an old monitor as well as an old laptop. The most important thing when you are projecting and when you are presenting is that you have these multiple screens. And as long as they can be side by side and be next to each other, this will allow you to toggle back and forth and to be able to refer to things and to be able to be effective when you are communicating. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this best practices video, we're going to be talking about making sure that your recording computer is going to be at eye level. Now, if you're going to appear in your tutorial videos on camera, and that means whether you're going to appear fully as the subject of the video or whether or not you're going to appear in the corner, as we've talked about, you need to make sure that your computer is going to be at eye level and mainly you want to make sure that your camera is going to be at eye level because whenever you are actually going to be talking to your audience you should be looking directly into the eye of the camera 
because that will then give the effect that you are actually talking to them. One of the things that is difficult about screencasting is that you can often, without necessarily trying to do so, look in a different direction, you can look off to the side, and it is distracting to the people who are actually watching your video. So two things that you need to do. Number one, make sure that you're going to bring your computer to eye level, and then wherever your webcam is, you want to make sure that you are able to look directly into it so that you can be direct and connecting with the people who are going to be watching. Now this whole setup is important for reading and navigational purposes too. So if you are actually scrolling through your points when you're talking on PowerPoint, it's more effective if you can see them and that they're at eye level. If you're not looking up at them, or you're not looking too far down at them. Having them directly in front of them is very important. Now in order to get your computer to eye level, you can purchase items from office supply stores or you can use books to stack until you get to the right height. Now once you discover the right height, that needs to be a short term solution. So all you're doing with the books is you're determining how high it is. You want to measure that. You want to know exactly how tall that is because that's what you're going to go and take to the office supply store. In the long term, the kind of solution that you want is going to be something that allows your laptop to be high at eye level but it needs to breathe so it won't overheat. So you don't want to have your laptop so it's sitting on top of something that will not allow the fan to cool it off. You want to make sure that it's open and that it's really running over something that is porous or already has holes in it. Again, just as we discussed in the last video, this does not have to be and it shouldn't be an expensive solution. Now, the one you're about to see costs about $3 and that's about as much as you have to pay. Notice how the area right behind the, the screen, it's breathed, it's porous, and it has holes in it, so the laptop can actually breathe. And it also raises the level of the laptop so that you can see eye level, so you can see the webcam if necessary, so you can read properly. You can actually have a real conversation with the people that are going to be watching your video. And you can see it a little better here. You know, again, notice the fact that this allows the laptop to breathe. There isn't a problem with overheating. And one of the things that happens over time is if you have a laptop and you don't allow it to breathe, you will cause problems with that laptop overheating, shortening the life of your laptop, having to buy other pieces when really this is a really simple, very inexpensive solution that will help you to do that while at the same time really bringing your PC to the level where you can actually use it. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Hello and welcome. Now, in this best practice video, we're going to be talking about your microphone in terms of the optimal computer setup. Now, if there's any one discussion that you probably see amongst entrepreneurs and anyone who is doing anything online when it comes to multimedia, it's about finding the best mic for your recordings. And sound quality is important, but there are going to be some other considerations with you using Camtasia 9. If you can have a place where you have absolute silence, any cartoid mic, such as the AT2020, the Blue Yeti, or any of those mics that are USB mics, they're going to produce great sound. However, however, depending on where you work from, it will probably be rare that you are going to have absolute silence and sometimes mics like the AT2020 or the Blue Yeti, they will pick up background noise. And it's for that reason that we're going to suggest an alternative and that alternative is a headset. In fact, a Plantronics headset, which we will show you here in a minute. Now, you're going to want to get the one that costs about $30 instead of the least expensive one. Now, the Plantronics headset plugs into your computer's stereo jack, so it does not plug into the USB port. It basically means you are not going to be using a USB mic. And this is important because a USB mic will always take up processing resources while you record. And when you actually choose to appear in your video, 
whether or not you're the subject of that video or you're appearing off to the side, this one fact is going to be very important because screencasting software like Camtasia is going to be computer resource intensive. And that means then that your video is going to have latency mismatches where your video is doing one thing and your voice is doing another wing and that happens often when you use USB microphones. Now a stereo mic avoids this problem. Now yes, you are going to sacrifice some quality but not really that much and it's always going to be good enough for a solid tutorial. Now, the other thing that headsets like this do extremely well is noise cancellation and will not require you to have absolute silence where you're recording from. Regardless of what kind of headset you purchase, make sure you get something that will help you to block out noise on your mic. And that will also reduce pops in your recording. Now one of the things you're going to want to do when you are screencasting, particularly with Camtasia 9, is that you want to position your mic away from your mouth directly. This is going to keep you from producing pops. Now let's take a look at the mic. Again, we're not talking about a huge expense and these mics are readily available, very inexpensive and what you'll notice again is that these mics plug into the stereo jack. They do not plug into the USB jack. The latency issue is a big one and you'll often see it when people are producing video and they have a tutorial video where they appear in that video Unless you have a massive amount of computing power, you want to make sure that you are making the most of your resources. And if you want to get started using Camtasia 9 before you go out and get a powerful computer, you can do that if you use the stereo jacks in your microphone. And again, here are very inexpensive alternatives to be able to add to your mic, to slide right over to the mic head. And again, this will help you to avoid pops. It'll help you to block out some of the noise while you're talking. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about the best practice of using a production machine. Now, one of the ways that you're going to save time is not having to produce or render, is the other term, your videos on the same computer that you work on. And Camtasia Studio will allow you to use two installations for one license. As long as you are the person using both of those installations, it's legal within the terms in which you purchase Camtasia Studio. This means that you can place your second installation on another computer that you use. And we're calling this, in this video, a production machine. Now you will use this computer to do the final processing or the rendering or production of your videos. And the best way to do this would be to use an external drive and to plug it into your production PC. Now if you use any kind of special assets in your library, you're going to need to make sure that you export those assets out of your library on one machine and export them into the library on your production machine. Now this means you can either hand over the videos that you create to someone else to render or you can work on your videos and render them all at once on your production machine and walk away. Now previously in the course we talked about how you can batch render multiple videos. In other words you can set all your videos up at once and then use the batch requirement and remember that batch can be found and remember the batch can be found here in the file area and then if you recall there is a batch production link and this gives you the opportunity then to go and get those multiple files for you to run all at once. So if you're creating a course or a series of videos you can work on the creation and then you can set all of your rendering jobs on your production machine. And what this really means is that you can keep working so you don't have to worry about all the resources on your computer being taken up to render your videos. You can continue to work on your main PC and then run your jobs on your production machine. You are also then free to run your jobs on your production machine and then do whatever else that you'd like to do. 
Now, there is an important discussion to have about a production machine. And it is that technically in the terms of service, Camtasia says that you cannot run Camtasia concurrently even if you are the user of both installations. Those are the terms in version 9. Now, in a recent discussion with Camtasia on their social media, it was asked of them whether or not this production machine clause is still valid. And basically, if you look in this area, we verified that you can still use the function of doing production machine and that this is an appropriate use according to Camtasia if you read this. So even though the terms technically would leave out the production machine out of version 9, verifying with Camtasia as of right now the recording of this video that this is something that they are perfectly fine with. But once again, if you're unsure, make sure that you do your own follow-up, that you follow up with Camtasia. You don't want to break the terms of service and then have your license to Camtasia revoked. Make sure that you verify if this is something that you want to do. And it's certainly something that you should want to do because it will make you much more efficient and it will allow you the freedom of being able to work on your PC while your videos render on your production machine. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to be discussing setting up your home network for production using Camtasia 9. Now, we talked about using an external drive last time, and that's so that you can transfer files. So you would produce the files on one machine, save them onto your external hard drive, then take that external hard drive plug it into your production machine and then start the rendering process on a second machine while you work on the machine that you do all your work on. But now there are other ways to do this and if you choose not to go that route and buy an external drive but you still want to render videos on that production machine or on that different computer you can actually do so. Now what you'll need to do is to make sure that your home network can actually see, can actually recognize all of your computers and all of your drives. Then, as we said earlier, you will need to make sure that you have all of your assets on your production machine. So let's take a look at what we mean by that. Now typically if you have computers connected by a home network you'll be able to see all of those computers on the same network in this area of Windows. And as long as you can see those other computers, you can actually access their hard drive, provided that you've done all of the networking involved. So what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to see the network drive on another PC. So for example, as you can see this particular computer on this network, even though this is not the computer I'm working on, I can move files over to this drive and this computer can see, for lack of a better word, into mine. So they can move files back and forth to mine. So what that means is that I can actually access files to do my transfer using my home network. So that when you're using Camtasia 9 and let's say that you want to run a batch job, what you're going to do is you're going to go and add files. Well, where are you going to go get those files? Where That's when you'll go and get the files from the network as opposed to getting them from your hard drive. Now this actually does work best if the files are local but in some cases what you can do is you can transfer all of the files temporarily through the network. You can operate it that way. You know if you find that that's too much stress on your network you can make some accommodations but the point is that you can use your home network to access files back and forth and you can use them to run on Camtasia. As we said before, the most important thing is that if you're using assets from your library, these libraries have to match on both the production machine as well as this one. Otherwise, if you start rendering a video, your production machine will look for these assets. And if you don't have them on your production machine, it'll stop the process. So you have to make sure that you've exported your entire library from the computer you work on 
to your production machine. And you can do that very easily if you just go to the library tab and then you look for export library. So you're just going to export your library to a zip drive and then you're going to re-upload it on your production machine. And of course, this is what we've been talking about. You can then have your production machine access the files on your creation machine in order to render your videos. That's really the point of having this network set up and having everything in one place. And this can be especially helpful when you have multiple videos to do and you're going to run these jobs in a batch and you've either got to keep working or you've got to set it up so that you can start a process, walk away, and then come back to your personal computer and do some work without having the resources tied up. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to be talking about Camtasia Projects Media and Recordings briefly. We talked about in the main course that you want to make use of Camtasia Projects. So yes, you're going to record video. Yes, you're going to have a file that you're going to be working with. However, you want to be in the habit of also using the project files, which is any changes that you make, anything that you edit, anything that you add, any annotation that you make. When you save it over in that project, what happens is you haven't done anything to the original recording, and it gives you the opportunity to work with that original file over and over again in different ways project means that you're going to be able to save your edits in a file as you make them. And it also means you can work with multiple media sources. So in other words, if you want to bring in another video, if you want to bring in some other audio, if you want to bring in something that's not in the library, you can. And you don't have to worry about it causing any problems with something that you've previously done or even causing any problems with the recording. Because all these things go along with or right on top of the recording when you actually use them. And the only way that you can make use of those things is that you have to use the project feature. So basically what a project does is it saves time. It saves you time from having to redo and restart videos once you have made a mistake. And this is a major thing to learn that you want to make sure that you're saving the projects. Once you have corrected something or even if you make a mistake you can always go back and fix that mistake through the editing process so don't record over and over again do one take and then just use your project file you think of something that you want to insert into the video you want to use a project you think of something that you want to change about a project you use the project file now this is an important concept to understand especially as we approach this next concept in the next video, which is doing all your videos in one take, something that we mentioned in the basic course, but we really want to kind of expand on that and let you know why this is important to do, why it saves time, and why it's going to affect how you do the rest of your videos. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about another concept, which is doing all your videos in one take. And you do have to understand concept we talked about previously, which is projects. Making sure that you're doing all your videos in one take. It requires that you use the project feature. Anytime that you, anytime that you add or change anything, you don't want to stop the recording and start another one over. You want to save even the mistakes to your project file. It's much more effective to do this and go back and edit out your mistakes. To do this, you want to be able to see on the timeline where you need to edit by putting a marker there. And we've shown you how to do this, but let's go over that again. And you can do that by going to the marker menu and then just going to this bar. And you can do that again. You can do that as many times as you want to. And remember, you can also do this during the recording process by hitting the marker key while you're actually recording, which is, again, yet another reason why you want to make sure that you are doing your videos with at least two screens. You want to be able to have that timing, that marker off to the side where you can click it yet at the same time keep focused on what it is you're presenting. 
Now, what some marketers, myself included, mark their own edit space by stopping, allowing a little silence to pass, and then clapping three times loudly near the mic, like this. What this does is this produces a visual effect on the audio timeline that'll look different than anything that you're doing if you're talking. And that means when you see those three claps, when you see that signal, that means then that that's where you need to go and focus your attention in editing. Now again, you can do this while you're actually recording. So while you're recording, if you're kind of cruising along and you're talking and then you discover, oh, I should have said something else. What you want to do is you want to stop, clap three times, and then go back to the point where you should have said something different. And then you'll know how to determine where it is you're going to actually place your edit. But you mark the place at which you make the mistake during the recording process. And of course, as we said, all of this is going to be visible on the timeline. And, and as you do these things, you want to be able to keep your changes and you save them as you go into your project file. Now, the other thing that you want to do, you want to make sure that you program the pause button as you record the way that you want it. And this is an important thing because you need to be able to pause the recording at the push of a button. If you try to do it by catching your mouse and trying to figure out where you're going to click on the actual uh, recording toolbar, it'll keep you from finding the most accurate point and delay you in how you're going to be able to edit your video. So you want to make sure that pause button is programmed the way that you want it. And basically what that means is that when you look at your tools option inside your recording toolbar, you want to make sure that whatever you program this to be, that you know what it is. If it's going to be F9, it's going to be Control F9, that you're able to go to that button and you're able to click it in order to make the recording do what you want it to do. So there will be a default, but you can change that default to be whatever you want it to be. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about recording picture and picture video. And rather than go over some of the technical aspects of this process, it's kind of important to give you some ideas on how to think about this. And then the technical parts will be fairly simple. Picture in picture video is a good way to personalize your tutorial videos. What you're doing is you're putting a, an image or a video of yourself, typically in the bottom right hand corner. And so if you think about seeing a square of yourself, the, your entire background, and you really giving life to the video, this is a great way of personalizing a PowerPoint video or even sometimes a screen share video. And what this does is allows you to protect yourself while you're explaining your concepts. So it's not just you being detached from the subject. You are really giving people an idea, probably teaching someone an idea that either you agree with or something that you have some strong feelings about. Now, you do want to be aware of where you're going to be on the screen. And one of the things we talked about in the main course is the fact that you can put this square, you can organize it any place. You can put it any place on the screen. You can arrange it at the top right, top left, any place that you want. However, if you're going to be recording PowerPoint or even if you're going to be recording screen share videos, you need to be aware while you're recording of where the video is going to be. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see the square while you're recording. So if you know you're going to be in the bottom right hand corner, you want to leave that area open, whether or not you're doing PowerPoint, whether or not you were doing screen sharing. And yes, you want to recreate your slides knowing where your video is going to appear. And this is especially going to be helpful because you don't want to go back and redo slides or you don't want your video to overshadow the words. Remember, you're not using words to have people read. You're using words to enhance or bolster what it is you're trying to say in your video. Now, you could use your computer's webcam in order to do this, but it's probably going to be best that you get a webcam that will enhance this process. 
And it's recommended that you get a webcam like the Logitech 930E. And there's a reason that this is a recommended camera. It's probably going to be a little more expensive than your average webcam, but it renders at 1920 by 1080, which is high definition. And it really uses less of your computer's processing power. In other words, the resources of the webcam run inside of the webcam as opposed to other cameras where the resources run on the computer. That's very important because it keeps you from having latency in your video. It keeps you from having a mismatch between what's happening in the video and people hearing your words. And this makes a very credible video and actually keeps people paying attention. You can see the Logitech 930 right here. And actually, it doesn't look different than any other webcam. What's most important, and even if you can't get this particular camera, you don't like this one, you want to get one where the resources do not have to run on the PC. That's the most important thing. That's what makes for the timing in your videos to be in sync with the actual webcam. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about converting some of your project files to MP3. And in version 8 of Camtasia, which is what you're seeing on your screen, you're looking at the batch production. And what we're going to do is we're just going to grab some files here. And we're going to go through this process. And we're going to go and look at one particular preset, which is the MP3 preset. And it used to be that you could do just this, which is to convert. We're not going to go through this entire process, but you could convert a video using Camtasia to MP3. Now, we're going to go to Camtasia 9. Uh, that feature no longer exists. So you can no longer use your batch to convert multiple videos into multiple MP3s. The other thing is that when you want to convert a file, you can export an audio to a WAV file or to an M4A file. But again, you cannot do this during a batch. Now the only format that you can actually use during a batch, we're going to show you this, we're just going to go through this process. And if we were to look for a particular preset, we have one set up for new M4A audio. So we can actually run a batch job for M4A audio, but that's the only audio that we can run a batch for. So the way to convert multiple files at the same time is to bring them into your iTunes account. Now, if you don't have iTunes, iTunes is free in order to download to your hard drive. And once you actually have these files in a certain playlist, you can then highlight them all and you can then create an MP3 version. So the process is a little more indirect. You're going to have to batch produce M4A files you're going to pull those M4A files into iTunes, and then you're going to bulk turn them into MP3 versions just by highlighting them all and then clicking Create MP3 Versions. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to be talking about taking the batch job that you have run and then being able to finalize for production and delivery using a time-saving process. Once you've created all your videos, you're going to want to package them for delivery and for sale. And you can do this very easily with the ROM Zipper program. Now with ROM Zipper, you can zip multiple files simultaneously. And the most important thing is that you have all your files in the same folder without any additional folder. Now, what this does is this makes the batch job that you just did easy to zip and easier to upload to your host in order to deliver them to your buyer. You can find ROM Zipper by just Googling download ROM Zipper. It is a free program. And once you get it on your hard drive, let's take a look and see what it will do. When ROM Zipper opens up, what you want to do is find the folders where your 
files are that you're going to want to work with. And we found ours. You're going to notice that there are 10 files. And what we want to do is we want to bundle these. And we want to bundle these all at once and we want to bundle these quickly. Well, now that we have found the folder, all we're going to do is we're going to highlight all of our files. And then we're going to click zip files. And then we're going to figure out where we want them to go. And we're going to put them in the very same drive where they came from. As soon as we click OK, ROM Zipper is going to start the process of bundling up our files. And you'll see that here in the left hand corner. It doesn't take very long. And then what you'll see is you'll see the files come into view. And then all you really have to do then is take your files and upload them wherever you like to host them. And that's a very easy way of being able to bundle the content that you ran with the batch and then continue to save time to put your effort into other things. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Hello and welcome. Now in this video, we want to explore the drawing tool. And so you're looking at your recording toolbar for Camtasia 9, and we're going to just start by clicking the record button. Remember, we get this message because we're actually using two instances of Camtasia. You will not see this warning message. When we click OK, the countdown will begin. OK, so we have Camtasia set to minimize to the toolbar, so we're going to bring this up. And what you're going to notice is that the effects menu comes up. And we've already seen where we can add a marker, but the part that we are going to look at right now is the screen drawing and of course if you're using multiple screens this toolbar would be off to the side so this would not be showing to your viewer but this is a fairly useful tool and what you'll notice is that when you click the screen draw button the rest of the effects come available now what we can do is we can actually choose to use the pen which we have, and let's see what the pen actually does. One of the things that it does is it draws, right? And so this probably works extremely well if you have a tablet, but it works very well even if you don't. And you are able to draw lines on your presentation. which again, lends to more of the credibility. Now, you don't have, with a mouse, it would be very difficult for you to write like this, but you can draw and you can draw circles. And of course, we're able to do that in the editing process also. We can also explore where we can change the color. Right, so we can change it to blue. We can also change the width. So we can make the lines fairly thick. So once again, I mean, you see that we can use each of these effects and we can actually close this effect and do away with it. Now, the way that you would actually cause the writing to go away, so for example, if we were to draw a line around this circle, all we would need to do is to hit the escape key and then the toolbar closes and the writing goes away. So once again, we decide on the pen we're going to use, and the width, and then when we're tired of writing or we don't want to have it appear on the screen, we can click OK. And actually, then, we go back to being able to use our mouse. So once again, this drawing feature is a useful tool when you have information on a PowerPoint and sometimes it's less dynamic than you'd like it to be. Well, this is one way of being able to keep your viewers' attention without having to do things with the animation or make your PowerPoint inconsistent. You keep your PowerPoint consistent and then you use points of emphasis 
using tools like the screen draw program. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Now, in this video, we want to discuss some things that you want to do before you hit record. And at the end, you're going to understand why these things are important to do beforehand. And of course, it almost seems that this would be elementary. You want to make sure you have your content ready. If you're going to read it, if you're going to refer to it, it needs to be available before you actually hit the record button. You shouldn't have to go and search for it, and you really don't even want to pause the video to go get it. It really does disturb the continuity. It can disturb the level of your voice. It can disturb a lot of things if you have to stop your presentation in order to retrieve something that should be readily available right in front of you. Now, screencast videos work best when you already have some knowledge or expertise, and that it goes without saying. If you're going to be presenting something, even if you're presenting something that you're using the private label rights in order to present, you should have some knowledge. You shouldn't be reading it for the first time if you're going to do a video that's actually going to be interesting enough for people to listen to. You don't want to read anything. If you read from a PowerPoint, if you read from a Word document, it's going to sound like it. And so you always want to have some knowledge of the subject matter so that if you have to stop reading or if you have to stop referring and you actually have to give an anecdote, you actually have to talk or tell a story, you are going to be able to make it interesting for your audience for your viewers. Open up the tabs on your browser ahead of time in sequence. You want to think through your presentation. So don't get to your presentation and have to open up tabs and open up browsers. The time that you think it takes as a video creator is a lot longer to the person experiencing it. You don't want to spend your time on camera opening tabs, looking for things in your browser. These things should already be ready. They should already be in sequence. And this is especially true when you're looking at programs like Google Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer. These, these give you the opportunity to set up tabs ahead of time. You should have already thought through your presentation before you actually hit the record button. And this has been said in many different instances. You don't want to linger on any screen too long. So if you're screencasting, don't leave your screen up very long. Now, obviously, sometimes you're going to have to uh, violate this principle, but Hollywood actually changes screens every eight seconds for a reason. That's because our attention span is just short as, as human beings. And this could also have to do with the modern day. So you want to make sure that if you can, you want to switch something on your screen for a minimum of, of every eight seconds. And if you keep some action going of any kind, you know, we talked about using the markers, uh, viewers will not be quick to lose interest. Again, this has been discussed before, but don't create videos with two or three subjects. You show people things one at a time. You talk about one subject at a time. Even if the video is very short, it's better if you have one subject in one video rather than three subjects in one short video or one medium length video. You want people to be able to look at the title of the video and know exactly what they're about to get and then decide to click on it and watch it. What you don't want is for you to have to make a title that's so very long that people don't know exactly what you're saying or for them to click on a video and actually think they're getting something and then they get a lot more or less than what they really thought the video was going to be about. Always assume your viewer knows nothing. You know, break down your video into bite-sized chunks, again, short videos one concept at a time. You don't want to try to do something really complex unless you're really breaking down the steps. And if so, try to keep your steps in separate videos. If you are going to add in title clips and music, you want to select them before you start the project. Again, that goes without saying. And if you're recording multiple videos, it's important to make sure that your content is uniform. So in other words, you are doing a series of 10 videos, then you want to do everything you can to make sure that your voice is uniform, the PowerPoint is uniform, everything that you're doing should look similar to all the other videos in the series. That's pretty important to do. And this is probably the same. You want to try to avoid using different styles inside of one video. If you're going to do screen sharing, try to skip. If you're going to do screen sharing, 
Try to stick to screen sharing. If you're going to do animated, try to stick to animated. Don't do a lot of different styles in one video. Again, it's disorienting for the actual viewer. And it can be confusing. And even though it might keep their attention, it might not get your point to where you actually want it to be. Now, why is this all this important? And we've actually hinted at this. Because to do something like this, and this is what you don't want to do. You don't want to type on your screencast video and go looking for websites. You don't want to search for information. This is disorienting and it's an invitation for people to tune out of your video. All of the typing that you can do ahead of time, you want to do it ahead of time. You don't want to type on your video and if you must do it, if you must type, even after you have set things ahead of time, you pause the video, then type. This is an important distinction to make. So again, you pause the video, then type. Do your typing, write in the information you want, and then come back to the video because that really holds your viewer's attention and makes your videos concise. And it also gives them the opportunity to connect with your information. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now in this video, we're going to be talking about one of the little used features in Camtasia. People typically use tools in order to create GIFs. And this is actually something that you can create in Camtasia. So what we're going to do in order to create a GIF, of course, we are not going to use the audio. And once again, whenever we make a big change like this, and we're going to do something totally different with the file, we're going to save it into what? A new project. So we're going to go to the file. And we're going to save this as a new project. Okay, so we've got our indication from Camtasia that our project is saved. And so we have a video file on track one. And so typically, if you can, typically, if you have a short video clip, something like five seconds at the most, typically three to seven seconds. And what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to split this track. Actually, let's get rid of the let's get rid of the marker area. And then let's go ahead and split this track and we're going to do away with this part. And we just want a little short video clip that we can use in order to create a GIF. And Camtasia makes this very easy to do. If you can get the video onto the timeline, you're going to click and you're going to do a new custom production. And you'll see here one of the menu options is to create a GIF or an animation file. Now all of these factors are going to be the default settings. And it, for the most part, you probably want to leave the default settings as they are unless you know of a reason to not use them. So we're going to continue on with the default settings in Camtasia. We are not going to embed this in HTML. And so once we do this, we're just going to click next. Now we're going to have a place where we save it and we're going to click finish. So the video renders fairly quickly and then there's a process. You'll be able to use this GIF as your image and you'll be able to use it where you want animation for your viewers to see. Okay, so that is a very simple way of being able to create a GIF, having a short video clip, three to five seconds, maybe seven at the most, put it on the timeline, scratch out the audio, and then run the GIF sequence. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. And one of the ways you should absolutely be using Camtasia, if you haven't done so already, is in conjunction with screencast.com to do customer service. So right now you're looking at a web browser, you're looking at your recorder. So let's give a scenario where you would have to explain to your customer how to do research on Google. And this would take a Google search. And you'd want to show them how to look. 
Now, of course, one of the good things that you can do with Camtasia is actually walk through that process where you type in the search term, where you get the search term, where you scroll through the list of information to find out which one would be best to do. And of course, all you're going to have to do in order to do this is to hit your recording toolbar and to record. Now, once again, this message comes because we're recording with two instances of Camtasia. Right now, this is going to start the recording. And so, if we look through our digital camera information, this is just hypothetical. And even if we were to find out what other keywords there were, and then decided we were going to look at information here just based on that. Well, being able to do quick video tutorials is one of the best little ways that you can actually use Camtasia in order to do customer service and in order to explain to your clients exactly what you mean. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So what happens after the recording? Well, okay, so we stop the recording. It's about 41 seconds. And what happens is the video comes into the media bin. And we're going to bring it down to the timeline. Now, one of the things that we can do is we can share this video to screencast.com. And what we're going to do with it at screencast.com, we're going to get a link to give to our customer. So let's go do that right now. So we're just going to look briefly at the fact that this project is rendering. We're going to turn the camera back off until it's complete. Okay, so now it's completing and complete. It will now upload to Screencast which is a fairly short process depending on how much space your video is actually going to take. So now what do we have at Screencast? Well we have a link and we have a video. So instead of trying to explain to our customer exactly what we're trying to tell them, we will just grab this link and we will pass it on to them. And after some time, we might want to go into screencast and clear out some of those videos. But this gives us an opportunity to give high levels of customer and client service. And at the same time, save ourselves time by making sure that we explain things correctly the first time. So Camtasia is great for this use. And it mirrors another TechSmith program called Jing. A number of entrepreneurs and educators use that system and it works just as well. Camtasia does the very same thing as Jing. So make sure to use this tool in a way that helps you best. And with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now in this video, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and produce a video for screencast.com, and then we want to use the embed tool to our WordPress website. So what we're going to do is we're just going to produce a video. We're going to uh, assume that this video is already an interactive video. So we're not going to go through the process of creating another interactive video. We're just going to go ahead and create the video and upload to screencast.com. Okay, so the upload process is completing. And you're going to notice that you now have an embed code. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and copy that embed code. We're going to head on over to our WordPress site. And we get to WordPress, what we're going to do is we're going to just add a new post. And we're going to use the text box. So we're going to write in a title and then we're going to embed our content. Okay, so we're going to just drop that text in there. And then we're just going to click publish. Now what we can do is we can take a look at our post. And what we're going to notice is that this video is really taking up too much space in this frame. So we're probably going to have to adjust it. So we can assume that all the way across is going to be about 900 pixels. So if we are someplace in the area of 
four or five hundred wide, that should help us in some way. So we're going to go into the code and we're going to change the width to 640 by 480. And one of the reasons why we're doing that, of course, is that maintains the aspect ratio. So in other words, 1920 by 1080, we want to try to keep this as close as we can to the aspect ratio. So we've done that by going to 640 by 480. We're going to update our post. And now we're going to take a look at it again. Okay, so our video now fits in our post. So we want to make sure that if we're going to be giving instructions for our interactive video that we have those instructions here and that we title this appropriately but what we have now is we have the ability to put our interactive video on a specific page on the web we're going to use our WordPress site to do that and if we already have a WordPress site that we're using we can embed this code the video will serve from screencast.com and it will be interactive and that's going to be important in something that we are going to do in a future video. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we're going to go over what we can do with our markers if we want to section off different parts of the video. We can do that with a table of contents, and all we have to do is use our marker code we want to make sure that our marker is showing. When our marker bar is showing, we mark off the different points that we want. Now, obviously we're doing this arbitrarily. You would obviously do this according to your content. Then we wouldn't rename each marker. Okay, so now that we have our chapters lined up, and we have them marked off, What's going to happen is that Camtasia, when it produces the video, it's going to give people the opportunity to skip ahead through different elements of the video based on the chapters that we have designated. Now again, this again is another interactive video and the only way they're going to be able to do that is if they use the smart player. So we can have this on screencast.com or we can have it on our server. And one of the things that we'd like to show you in this video is how the filing system works and how you would actually put it on your server. We've already seen how you'd put it on screencast.com. But now let's go ahead and process this video. We can walk through the table of contents process and then we can actually see how the file structure will be. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to now create a local file. And now that we have the custom production settings, we can go forward. We're going to choose the smart player. And then we're going to customize our actual player. Now, to skip ahead, we're just going to work with the table of contents. We want to make sure it's ready and that it's searchable. Then we're going to click Next. Now, we're going to have one more screen after this. I'm going to click Next. And we're actually going to now be able to dictate what our table of contents is going to be like. We can fix it to the right or fix it to the left. We can have text with, with thumbnail. We can number marker the entries. So we've got some flexibility over what our table of contents is actually going to look like. So now what we're going to do is we're going to click Next. And we're going to go ahead and produce our project. And one of the things you're going to see right off the bat is we're going to have a number of files that are going to be available to us. So now we're just going to click Finish. And then we're going to let the project start its rendering. Now the video is complete and you can see that we have our table of contents. It's clickable. But now this video is now on our hard drive. What we're going to do now is we're going to take those files and we're not going to upload them to our server. So we're going to come back here and open our production folder. Here are all the files. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to upload them to a site. And so now the same file can be served from our server 
and can be represented here on our site. So the same smart player is there, the same level of interactivity is there, it's now on our site and not on screencast.com. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in the last video, we talked about the fact that we can have... In the last couple of videos, we talked about the fact that we can have these interactive videos on individual web pages. And so now it's time to talk about, well, what can we do inside that interactivity? Uh, having a table of contents is great. It may or may not necessarily direct people in the way that we want. It doesn't necessarily elicit information from them. It does make for a more pleasant experience for the user. However, using hotspots is one way for us to be able to direct a user who's watching our video to take an action. And so when we actually use, and we're going to go into the annotations, and we're going to grab the interactive hotspot, and what we want to do is want to pick a period a specific period of time where our video is and we want to do something with that video we want the user to have to click something now the most important thing when you do this is to remember that you're gonna to have to give the user some instructions so this might be a point at which you are going to give them you're gonna write something in here Right, you might write something in here. We're going to go ahead and, and leave that one there. We might write something in here like Right, so we give them some instructions. Click explain if you want to talk to someone personally. And we want the hotspot then to do something. Right? We want them to click on that word explain. And then we want something to be able to happen when that happens. And so we want to do something over here in the properties. And we can have it so that someone, when they click it, they actually go to a URL. Basically what we're trying to do in this hotspot is we're trying to get the user to do something and again if you combine this with being able to be on a specific web page and have this interactive video where you're going to give them some information and then at each point you're going to compel them to a call to action and when they take that call to action send them to a specific website you then have interactive marketing and customer service keeping them engaged and we go beyond trying to entertain or just inform people but to get them to take some kind of action and that's really what interactive hotspots are at the heart of and we can do that very simply by making our button clickable and by making sure that the video does not go any further until they take some kind of action now we want to make sure that our words are at the same point at which the hotspot comes so that the user then starts to understand okay well maybe if I click this then something will move on everything depends on the kind of instructions that you're able to give so when someone clicks a certain link if they want to talk to someone personally what's a good thing for us to do well the good thing for us to do is to try to get some information from them right is to try to figure out maybe to try to help the person who's going to be taking the call or to help the person who's going to be serving that person to try to find out a little bit more about them and we want to be able to send that person to a place where they can give us some information and that's really where our surveys come in and so this URL can be a page on your WordPress site with another interactive video basically what we're doing is we are figuring out ways for us to chain together the interactivity so we're not just informing we're getting involved with the customer and we're actually getting information from them hopefully okay so with that thanks and I will see you in the next video now that you understand the concept of daisy chaining the hotspots you can now look at surveys in a different way and so what we're going to do is we're going to open up a quiz even though we're not really looking to quiz anyone we're really looking to do a survey 
And so we're going to ask some questions. I'm going to write a question in here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to display the feedback. And so if a person answers a certain way, we want something to happen. So we're going to write in here. Now, we're not thinking in terms of quizzing and writing and wrong. The question is, who is your favorite copywriter? And there's an answer. So if, it's, if the person says Dan Kennedy, well, then we want to send them to, maybe it could be our affiliate link. Maybe it could be our site. Maybe it could be something where we are doing something that is representative of Dan Kennedy. We want to put that in there. Now, if you follow this, what you also could do now that you know you can put another video survey on your site is you can send the person to the next survey to narrow down their answers. So in other words, they answer the first question and maybe you want to send them to a follow-up question. Well, then you're going to have a video there and another set of questions. And you can do that by dictating what URL they go to and you can actually have the video embedded in your WordPress site or you can have it hosted on your site. It really doesn't matter but you can deliver them to another interactive video where they can answer another question. Ultimately, your goal is to get them to some place where it's gonna be advantageous for them, the customer. Now, you want to be able to make sure that the viewers don't see their results. We do wanna score the quiz though. Okay, now when all of these elements are where we want them, now we've got a, we've got a survey there, we're going to send the person someplace. They're going, to, they're going to see their feedback. And so now what we want to do is we want to start the processing. And when we get to this page in the production wizard, we know that quizzing is now available. It's now no longer grayed out. So what we can do is we're going to continue to go forward. And now we're going to produce our video. Now, one thing that we also get the opportunity to do is we get the opportunity to customize our quiz. Now, this is the table of contents section. We go past that and we get to customize our quiz. And this is where we make sure that we're communicating the right things to our prospect, our customer, or our acquaintance. We want to make sure that our button says, take a five minute survey or a short survey and that we have niche specific information in these, these spaces so that when they see our quiz, they are not unfamiliar with it and it's gonna make sense that they should want to take the survey in order to get something that you promised them. But you do have the opportunity to customize this information at the last screen before processing. And so once we process, we can either process as a smart player that we're gonna host on our site or we can back up and actually host this site on screencast.com and embed it on our website. We can do it either way. The important thing is that when the user takes some kind of action, that we send them to the next chain that we want them to be in. And if survey is the first part and you want them then to be sent to the page with the hotspot, you can do that, or you can do it vice versa. The, the point is, that your interactive quiz or your interactivity can send people to web pages. That's the most important thing. So whether someone watches a video all the way through or they get to a certain point, you can ask them to take an action if they want to see the rest of the video. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video. Welcome back. Now, in this video, we are going to talk a little bit about picture-in-picture picture videos. And you notice that the only, the only video that's in the canvas and on the timeline is actually a portrait talking head video. Now we can actually import any other video into this project that we want. And all we'd have to do is to go to file and the import command and look for other media. We can also look for recent Camtasia recordings. In this particular case, let's just pull one of the Camtasia recordings into the timeline. Okay, so now we have this recording. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and add it to the timeline at the playhead. Okay, so now we have a video and we have a talking head video. So what you're going to notice right away is that the 
talking head video seems to have disappeared. But as you can see, it's really on the bottom of two tracks, neither of which are opaque or either of which are invisible. So what we need to do is we need to move this track up and move the others down, right? And we can do that very easily just by changing the order of some of the tracks. Digital marketers and entrepreneurs, many of whom use systems like Facebook Live and YouTube, are looking for ways to be more connected. And one of the ways that they're doing that is by making sure that they are in their videos. But the other thing that they're doing, they're coming back to this medium, but with no background. And so you may be wondering how people are doing that. So how are they appearing as if they are literally on top of the screen? One of the first things you actually just did, you just made sure that your talking head video was on top of the timeline. Right now, we do not have a green screen, but if we did, all we'd really need to do is we'd need to take care of that color. And so we could go to the visual effects, and then we can drag on top of the track. Now, of course, we don't really have a color, a specific color to really take out, but you would want to make sure that if you wanted to appear right outside of your background that you just had a background that really contrasted with where you are and that it was some color that could be easily removed inside of Camtasia. The process is very simple and the most important part is to make sure that you have good lighting even before you get to Camtasia. And when you do that successfully what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to do things with hotspots that previously you may have been unable to do. And these are the two basic steps to being able to use Camtasia 9 in order to have your image cut out on top of your presentation. And all you really need to do is have a green screen video that's shot with green in the background. You're gonna remove that with the remove a color tool. And then you're just gonna make sure that the video is on top of the video. Okay, so with that, thanks, and I will see you in another video.